Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where we have just six rounds to figure out how the first degree could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Today, we were spiraling from Turkey, the bird, to Charlemagne. So any Americans listening are probably going to have an idea as to why I chose the starting degree, because it's going to be Thanksgiving soon, and we eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a pretty good reason. I agree. Also, turkeys are so weird. So also that. <laughs> Rosanna, what do you think about turkeys and Charlemagne? Uh, I know as much about one as the other. i really want to know what you know about charlemagne probably about as much as i knew about charlemagne before i read the article on charlemagne yeah not much is what i would say round one turkeys the birds they're large birds from the genus meligris They're native to the Americas, North, South, Central Americas, and people often eat them for holidays, at least in the United States. Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, Charlemagne's a way better name, by the way, glad you stuck with that one, Mm -hmm. was a conqueror from the 8th century. Rosanna, do you see anything that these two things may have in common? I, no, I mean, maybe Charlemagne came, it seems like that's too early to come to the Americas, but maybe so. Maybe he came over and ate turkey. Okay. So I'm going to say they're connected by the Americas. Yeah. Okay. So let's learn more about turkeys. Again, the bird. I'm going to say it every time because it's funny. (laughs) So I'm just going to be frank here. Turkey is not very interesting. (laughs) But delicious. Yes, they are delicious. Maybe you don't know you're into turkeys until you hear these interesting facts. Yeah. Interesting facts like males of both turkey species, there are two, have a distinctive fleshy wattle or this... This protuberance that hangs from their beak and looks pretty creepy. Is that fascinating? But no. I mean, I think anyone that's seen a turkey already knew that. That's true. It's called a snood. A snood? Okay, I didn't know that. Which is another name for those kind of crocheted net-like circular things that medieval women would put around their their buns. Like a hairnet? That's also a snood. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Medieval hairnet, yeah. Cool. I I never thought I'd hear those two words together. I know. Turkeys, not medieval hairnets, are the largest birds in their ranges, their geographical ranges. Like many other galliforms, like uh, pheasants and partridges, the male is much larger and more colorful than the female. Because he's got to look fancy. Yep. The etymology of the name turkey... Is slightly interesting. <laughs> One theory is that Europeans uh, first encountered turkeys in America, and they thought they were actually a type of guinea fowl, which were being imported into Europe by merchants from Turkey, the country. Oh, so turkeys were named after the country Turkey? Pretty much, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah, after the merchants from Turkey. Interesting fact about turkeys, and I'm not kidding, there's only one. (laughs) An infant turkey can be called a chick, a poult, or a turklet. Aww. Which is very cute. A little turklet. Round two. Rosanna, what could possibly be the next degree between turkeys and Charlemagne? All right. This is what I'm thinking. Okay. Turkey. (laughs) (laughs) 
geographically, that would get us a lot closer to Charlemagne, who is from Western Europe. The country of Turkey is my guess. All right. Your guess of Turkey, the country, is incorrect. Boo. The next degree is Galliforms. Yeah, that wasn't even on my list. I did have snood. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Are you saying Galliforms? Like forms from Gallifrey, it sounds like. Is this like a Doctor Who thing? I don't I don't know anything about Doctor Who. The Doctor is from the planet called Gallifrey. Oh, okay. Galliforms come from an order of heavy bodied ground feeding birds, like turkey, grouse, chicken, quail from both the New World and Old World. They're actually quail called New World Quail and Old World Quail. Oh, also includes the partridge, the pheasant, and the ptarmigan. Galliforms are chicken-like in appearance. I mean, which makes sense because chickens are galliforms. That, so that does make a lot of sense, actually. Mm-hmm. They have round bodies and blunt wings. They are anywhere from six inches to four feet. There are about 290 species in the galliform group. And you can find them in basically every part of the world's continents, Mm. except for uh, deserts and perpetual ice, where you're not really going to find many chickens pecking around. (laughs) Not going to find much of anything there. Yeah, really not so much. Never heard of a desert chicken. Or an ice chicken. Ooh, like Game of Thrones ice dragons, but ice chickens. No, that actually sounds terrible. Ice turkeys is even better. That is actually a lot better. Yeah. It's like a regular turkey, but it has icicles on its feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and its snood is just a bunch of icicles. Yeah, it's a very icy snood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> New band name, Ice Snood. Galliforms are very important because they often disperse seeds. Mm. And they are predators in ecosystems they inhabit. Also, they're often raised by humans as game birds for their meat and eggs. Mm-hmm. Earliest Galliform-like fossils, they weren't quite Galliforms, but they were their ancestors, are from the late Cretaceous period, about 85 million years ago. There was one particular fact that needed a citation in the article, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Just take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Like you should with a turkey, because it's delicious with salt. <laughs> Apparently, galliforms live five to eight years in the wild, and how long do you think they can live in in captivity? Um, well, it sounds like you're leaning towards they live longer in captivity, which is weird, but I'm going to say 12 years? 30 years. What? No, 30? Mm -hmm, That's what it says. A 30-year-old turkey? I mean, we don't have a citation, so really, we don't know. Hmm. That is a long time. Interesting fact about galliforms. Adult males of many galliform birds have one to several sharp, horny spurs on the back of their legs, and they use them for fighting. That seems... It's on the back of their foot? The back of each leg. So do they they fight back to back? (laughs) I don't know. I'm just picturing two turkeys doing the moonwalk towards each other. (laughs) Many of them are reluctant flyers, but they pretty much all fly. Oh, that is interesting. Now, you may have heard that turkeys don't fly, while turkeys actually do fly regularly. Round three. Rosanna, are you ready to guess the next degree between Galliforms and Charlemagne? Mm, Maybe. I wrote down two things. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to decide between old world quail and seeds, because both of those oh. seem like an explorer kind of like bringing things from one place to another. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Um, So I feel like you might have decided at this point to stop talking about birds. So I'm going to toss the quail idea. I don't know why I would ever want to stop. They're so fascinating. <laughs> I don't know. Seeds sound pretty exciting, so. (laughs) So what's your guess? Seeds. Oh, your guess of seeds is 
Incorrect. The next degree is desert. Oh. A desert is a barren area of landscape that gets very little precipitation, and usually living conditions are pretty hostile for plant and animal life. There are lots of trade routes that have been forged across deserts, especially across the Sahara Desert, traditionally used by caravans of camels, carrying salt, gold, ivory, and other goods. Deserts are formed by pretty much just from weathering. You get a bunch of variations in temperature between day and night, and that's that puts strains on rocks, mm. and then they break into pieces. And though you don't get much rain in deserts, when you do, it generally results in flash floods. Mm. And so rain falling on hot rocks causes them to shatter, and the resulting fragments and rubble get strewn all over the desert floor and further eroded by the wind. So deserts are just caused by weather. Huh. Interesting fact about dust storms. I thought that was pretty cool. So they start, as you'd expect, from wind. However, the wind blows the fine particles lying on the exposed ground. They start to vibrate. And when the wind picks up, the particles get lifted up. And when they land, they hit other particles, which jerks the other particles into the air, starting a chain reaction of sand hitting sand, throwing it up in the air. So it's not just the wind. It's this whole chain reaction. And that's why it moves so quickly. Huh. Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah. I just thought it was always just wind blowing it, but it's not. And that's why it's like circular clouds that seem to come up. Mm-hmm. Some more interesting facts about deserts. How much of the world's surface do you think is arid or semi-arid, desert or almost desert? How much of the land surface of the world? Um, 20%? 33%. About one-third. Mm-hmm. I mean, I thought 20% was high because that's a lot. <laughs> it's because it includes the polar regions. Oh, of course it does. Yep, cold deserts. So the Sahara is only the third largest desert in the world. It's 3.8 million square miles. <laughs> oh my gosh. The largest and second largest deserts in the world are the Antarctica Desert and then the Arctic at 5.5 million and 5.4 million square miles, respectively. Wow. Huge. That is really big. My favorite fact about deserts, the word desert itself comes from the Latin desertum, which originally meant an abandoned place. Yeah, I could see that. Somehow that sounds romantic. Round four. Rosanna? Yes. What is the next degree between desert and Charlemagne. Okay. I keep guessing towards somehow traveling, exploring, conquering, discovering. I'm, and I am continually wrong. However, <laughs> I'm going to keep going because <laughs> eventually okay, okay. it might work. So I'm thinking maybe it has to do with uh, one of the items that the camels take on the trade routes through the desert so i'm thinking like ivory or salt okay so let's go with salt my guess is salt your guess of salt is incorrect but man you were close oh really what is it it's caravan oh <laughs> <laughs> of course you focused too much yeah you needed to broaden your guess so a caravan, or travelers, is a group of people traveling together, usually on a trade expedition. Caravans were generally used in desert areas, often throughout the Silk Road, where traveling in groups really helped with defense against bandits, because you've got so many people, especially merchants, with a lot of expensive items, you're going to be a target for bandits. For sure. Also, it helped them trade in, kind of in bulk. Mm-hmm. In historical times, caravans connected East Asia and Europe, and they often carried really expensive stuff, silks, jewelry. They could be a really big investment, and the profit from a successful caravan could be huge comparable to the European spice trade that came later, mm. which was incredibly profitable. And all these expensive goods being brought by caravans attracted a bunch of rulers along important trade routes. They constructed caravanseries, which are 
from the description, sound very much like the desert markets that you see in movies. Oh, yeah. They had water for human and animal consumption, washing. Sometimes they had really elaborate baths, too. Which, where do they get all this water from? I don't know. They had food for animals, shops for travelers. Basically, half of Indiana Jones movies. Round five. Rosanna, what is the next degree between Caravan and Charlemagne? Is it Europe? Your guess of Europe is incorrect. The next degree is the Silk Road. Ah, of course it is. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get that one. I really thought about it, actually. The Silk Road. We're not talking about the deep web where you can buy drugs and order assassinations. I bet you could do those too, though. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> the original Silk Road was an ancient network of trade routes. They connected the East and the West, Asia to Western Europe, pretty much. Called the Silk Road mainly because it allowed people to trade Chinese silk to countries in Europe. And technically, the term Silk Road refers to both the terrestrial routes and the maritime routes. Oh. But... We're focusing on the terrestrial routes for this. It began in the Han Dynasty in 207 BC, but there was a lot of travel before that. They found Grecian bronzes and Chinese silk from 600 BC in Germany. Wow. And potential Chinese silk in Egypt from 1000 BC. The Chinese pretty much had a monopoly on silk. They had the silkworms. There were a whole bunch of different countries and cultures that traveled along the Silk Road. Uh, traders from ancient history that used the Silk Road were people like Syrians, Arabs, Iranians, Georgians, Armenians, and my favorite to say, the Azerbaijanis. The origin of the Silk Road is Chinese, and I think this is really interesting. So basically, the reason the Silk Road got started is because of weak horses. Let me explain. Okay. The soil in China lacked selenium, and this deficiency in the plants that horses ate caused horses to have muscular weakness and reduced growth, so much so that they could not carry Chinese soldiers. They weren't strong enough. So, because they were so frail, the Chinese needed superior horses, and they got those from nomads that bred them on the Eurasian steppes. And the nomads wanted things that only agricultural societies produced, like grain and silk. So they began to trade. And even after the construction of the Great Wall, which was actually extended to make room for the Silk Road, oh, the nomads started gathering at the gates of the wall to do these exchanges. Soldiers sent guards, were often paid in silk when they traded with nomads. And it just got bigger and bigger, and they went further and further Right. And that is how the Silk Road started. Now, the trade route was a big, big deal for a very long time. But it started to decline in the 5th century because of two monk spies. What? <laughs> there were two Nestorian Christian monks. They became spies, basically, and they found out how silk was made. And so monks were sent by the Byzantine Empire Justinian, and they... <laughs> went from Constantinople to China and stole silkworm eggs. <gasps> so they started producing silk in the Mediterranean, not as good as China because they didn't have all the experience and they, China's been doing it for forever. But this gave the Byzantine Empire a monopoly on silk production in medieval Europe. So you didn't have to go nearly as far as China to get your fancy silk. So it's probably cheaper. Mm-hmm. And it kept declining. The road was later heavily controlled by the Mongol Empire from the 13th century on, but that collapsed. Then there was warfare on and off for centuries. And the road, and a lot of societal collapses along there, plus the Black Death. So the road didn't do so well after that. Round six. Rosanna, what could be the final degree between Silk Road and Charlemagne? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you're all over the place. I cannot pin it down. <sighs> I have spying monks written down. 
I guess I'm going to kind of use my same guess as last time. I'll say Western okay. Europe. Your guess of Western Europe is incorrect. Bum, bum, bum. Ooh. You're 0 for 6, Rosanna. I know. Very sad. It is sad. But this one was probably a pretty tough guess. The next degree is ancient history. Oh, sh- oh shut <laughs> up. Shut <laughs> Uh, no. N- no. You know, it's ancient history. The last time you guessed right. Oh. Oh, oh, now. Now, no. How is that even an article? That what Does it take up the whole rest of the internet? It really does. It is massive. Oh, my gosh. That, that, I mean... <laughs> I mean, every day it would get longer, right? Literally, every single day it needs to be longer. So here's the thing. Ancient history is actually a very specific time period. It is the aggregate of past events from the beginning of writing and recorded human history, and it ends at post-classical history. It's really only about 5,000 years. So it's from about... The history covering all continents inhabited by humans in 3000 BC to 500 AD, which is fewer than 5,000 years. And now I'm confused as to their years here, because that's only 3,500 years. I mean, when you're talking about a subject that's that undefined, I feel like there's room for error, even a thousand (laughs) years. Yeah. There's some dispute on what the actual end of ancient history is, which is a really funny sentence to say. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Some say it's the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. Some say the coming of Islam, several other things, including the rise of Charlemagne. So here's the problem. There's a record problem with ancient history. (laughs) Weird. While lots of people could write, most people were not literate. Right. Until long after ancient history. But it's not just that. Hardly anything survived. One example, uh, Livy was a Roman historian who lived in the first century BC, wrote 144 volumes of history. Mm -hmm. Only 35 survived to today. Wow. And that's incredibly common. Most of the stuff is gone. We we talked before about the burning of the Library of Alexandria. So we lost a ton of history there. Yep. Yep. The biggest archaeological findings we have for ancient history tell us that that's when the Egyptian pyramids were built. The Terracotta Army was built in China, and the ancient city of Troy was built during ancient history. That's also when some religions were invented, which is weird to think of some of these ancient religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism actually being created then. Also, a bunch of science and technology was invented in ancient history. Again, a very specific time in history. (laughs) The Egyptians created the ramp and the lever. And also, uh, lots of maritime technology like ships and lighthouses. Ancient Greeks created the gear, the screw, and bronze casting techniques, among many other things. The Chinese took the first recorded observations of comets and supernova. And in India... They started studying astronomy, mathematics. Here's the scary thing. In India, in ancient history, before they knew about germs, they also invented plastic surgery. (gasps) What? No, thank you. So that is ancient history. Of course, I'm sure, as you'd expect, there is a ton more information in the article. There's a whole section on probably 30 different countries. So if you want to learn more about ancient history, go read it. Let's learn about Charlemagne. All right. Also known as Charles the Great. Lived from 742 to 814. He died at 71, which seems long for a conqueror. Yeah, not bad. He served as the king of the Franks. He took over for his father when he died. Uh, The king of the Lombards in northern Italy. And eventually the Holy Roman Emperor. He was a devout Catholic. He was pretty much at war with somebody during every year of his reign. The list of his campaigns is very long. 
He united a bunch of Western and Central Europe during the early Middle Ages. So there was a bunch of information on Charlemagne's campaigns, which I don't find super interesting. They didn't include any fascinating siege stories or there was no Suleiman Magnificent level coolness about his sieges in there. So I'm going to talk more about his personal life. He was married four or five times. His first relationship, and the nature of it's not very clear, it may have been a legal marriage, she may have just been a concubine, was Himiltrude, and he put her aside when he married in 770 Desiderata to sign a treaty with the Duke of Bavaria. So she was a Lombard princess. But when he was 28, less than a year into their marriage, he decided he didn't want to be married to her anymore and put her aside and annulled her marriage to him uh-uh. and married a 13-year-old <gasps> Swabian woman no. girl named Hildegard. He was 28. No. She was oh, 13. Gross. Seriously gross. So gross. Desiderata's father was going to go to war for this, but died suddenly, apparently of natural causes. Mm, suspicious. Uh-huh. They had nine kids together. Whoa. And there's a quote. I actually opened up her particular Wikipedia article, which is not very long. And there's a quote about her, which I think really sums up a lot of women in history. Quote, little is known about her life because, like all women of Charlemagne, she became important only from a political background, recording her parentage, wedding, death, and her role as a mother. End quote. Yep. There are a lot of articles like that. Yeah. Two of his other wives were only mentioned in some kind of postscript chart. And they were Festrata, who had two children with him, and then Lutgard. They didn't have any children together. He also had various concubines and illegitimate children with those wives. He had interesting relationships with his children. And I think he made some smart choices with his sons. You hear so much in history about sons fighting with their fathers so they can have some power. But he made... One of his sons, Carloman, the king of Italy, and a younger son, Louis, he made him the king of Aquitaine. So he gave them a little bit of power. He still had most of the power. Also, he did not tolerate insubordination. Another of his sons, he banished to a monastery because the guy had joined a rebellion against him. Oops. Seems like a pretty good reason to banish someone. I kind of agree. It's very disrespectful. He had kind of an unconventional relationship or even plans for his daughter's lives. He had them well-educated. He was a big believer in education. But he kept him at home with him, and he wouldn't let them get married. Oh. Probably to prevent cadet branches of the family that would challenge his main line. Right. But he did tolerate their extramarital relationships and let them kind of have common-law husbands. Oh. And he loved his illegitimate grandchildren that they produced. So at least he didn't, like, just cut them off from any sort of companionship. And after he died, their surviving daughters were banished from the court by their brother, Louis the Pious, and they had to go live in convents. Oh, what a jerk. He apparently was not as uh, forgiving of these non-marriages. That's ridiculous. Mm Mm-hmm. Another smart thing that Charlemagne did, in 813, he called Louis the Pious, who was the king of Aquitaine, and his only surviving legitimate son... He had him come to his court and he crowned him as co-emperor and just sent him back to Aquitaine. Then he spent the autumn hunting and in January he fell ill with pleurisy and died. So he had a nice succession set up. Right. I've never heard of a co-emperor before. (laughs) That's new. I guess if you're emperor, you can do anything you want. I suppose you can. Interesting fact about Charlemagne and this, I find the most interesting because I love all these old stories. Joffrey of Monmouth, who wrote all the King Arthur stories, like King Arthur and the Round Table, based them largely on stories of Charlemagne. Oh. Yeah. We've made it through all six degrees. We went from Turkey, the bird, to Galliforms, to Desert, to Caravan, to the Silk Road, to Ancient History, to Charlemagne. Rosanna, what'd you think of the spiral? Well, here's the thing. 
just like every time we do this show, it's like, as we're going along, we're like, there's no way that those things go together. That makes no sense. And then when you say them all at the end, all in a line, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I was very wrong every time. (laughs) You were really close on the caravans. Okay. Okay. The one I was close on. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea where we were going or how we were getting there. It's time for Whim of the Week. We have two whims this week. The first one is Thanksgiving. Because it's almost Thanksgiving and we're so excited. And Rosanna and I will get to see each other. And it's going to be so awesome. So excited. And we're going to eat a lot of food. I can't remember the last time we had a Thanksgiving together, actually. Yeah. Usually I have it here in Portland. Yeah, it's been many years. So I'm super excited to get together. So Thanksgiving is going to be great. And I hope that... Everyone that celebrates Thanksgiving gets to celebrate it how they want this year. And if you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, just have a great Thursday. Yeah. And eat whatever you want. And I'll say, too, if you're somebody that Thanksgiving or the holidays is a hard time for you, reach out if you have friends or family or if they're the problem. Hey, send me or Nikki a message. We'll totally talk to you about whatever you want to talk about. So don't feel like you're alone if this isn't an enjoyable time of year. Because for some people, it's not. I had a really depressing Thanksgiving one year in college. I couldn't go back home to visit family. It was just me and one of my friends. Everybody else in basically my entire building was just gone. And so we decided we were going to go get ourselves some food from the grocery store and walked all the way there. We got there. It had closed like 15 minutes before. So we ended up sitting in my apartment eating Domino's pizza and drinking straight out of a bottle of red wine, watching some black and white movie. That sounds really depressing. At least you weren't completely We did have each other. Yeah. Which really made it a lot better. And now it's a fun story. At the time, it was very sad. And our second whim of the week is something we are thankful for. Yes. Which is our new patrons on Patreon. If you don't know, we launched a Patreon very recently. And it's a place where listeners of the show, anybody that loves us or just maybe likes us a little bit, (laughs) can go and support us with a few bucks. And you get really cool stuff. You get early access to episodes. You can see lots of extra trivia that we post. We can post extra audio clips of things we cut from the show that you wouldn't hear otherwise. And my favorite reward. The best reward. (laughs) It really is. It's the monthly mini-sode of bloopers called Six Degrees of Bloopers. And we sing all of our theme music. Poorly. Oh, it's, it's terrible. It's slightly embarrassing, (laughs) very embarrassing, depending on your level of shame. (laughs) But it's full of things we cut, bad jokes, us attempting to say words correctly that we are really not good at saying out loud. Yeah, failing to say words correctly is more accurate. Mm -hmm. Weird conversations, lots of strange songs. But if you go on to patreon.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash six degrees of wiki you can support the show and get some cool rewards there are even some tiers where you can pick a starting degree or a whim of the week or get merch and our newest patrons are Teresa and sean deacon diana rojek sconard and vanessa vivian so thank you for supporting us thank you to our first patrons we love you that's our episode tune in next time for another six degrees of wiki keep up with us at six degrees of wiki.com and follow us on twitter facebook and instagram to let us know what you think looking for early access to episodes and bonus content like bloopers go to patreon.com to become a six degrees of wiki patron and get discounts on merch or even help us choose degrees thanks for listening and we'll see you next time Da 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 da